I'm Laura Norton, and this is One Strange Thing, the show where we search the nation's news archives for stories that can't quite be explained. We've been sitting on this one for a while. Now, once you hear it, you might at first feel that this particular tale was better suited to Halloween. But to our minds, late October of 2020 was spooky enough without any extra help from us. So we've saved this gem out of Atlanta, Georgia for just the right moment. You might call it a kind of eerie holiday present from our archives to your ears. This story first hit the papers in September of 1987. It was a typically hot fall in the South. Ragweed pollen and red clay dust and city grime settled onto the windshields of cars, sitting in parking lot-like traffic, waiting to inch in or out of the city. Just a bit past the downtown connector, where Interstate 75 and 85 meet, where all those cars sat, and knowing Atlanta traffic, may still sit today. There, in the city's west end, was a little house. It sat on a residential street called Fountain Drive. In 1987, the street was lined with rows of single-family homes, mostly two bedrooms, dating back to the Second World War. This is where we begin. The Associated Press gives us the basics. In September of 1987, Minnie and Will Winston had been living on Fountain Drive for 22 years. Minnie was 77 and Will 79, and they'd been married for more than 40 years. Per the Atlanta Constitution, Minnie was a retired teacher and Will a retired communications company porter. Their six-room house had plenty of space for two. After all, their children were grown and had long moved on to build their own families and careers. Based on what we pieced together from various local reports, at least two of those children had remained in the Atlanta area. Unfortunately, Will Winston's health was poor and had been for quite a while. Per the Associated Press, he needed daily dialysis treatments, which the couple performed at home. And, as one would imagine, the treatments tired him out. Most nights, Will went to bed hours before many. He'd set the alarm and leave her to her own devices. According to reporter Ken Sugar, who covered the story for UPI, Minnie Winston was something of a night owl. On the night of September 8th, 1987, she was still awake at 11 p.m. That's when she decided to take a bath. Just a little relaxation on a regular Tuesday evening. Per the AP, Minnie was in the tub for about 30 minutes the perfect ritual to unwind at the end of the day. At least, it would have been, except for one strange thing. When Minnie gathered her towel and made ready to step out, she saw it, a puddle on the bathroom floor, a red puddle, spreading quickly. Had something spilled? But no, it seemed to originate on the floor, or rather, from in it. From inside it, there, like some backwards leak, a tiny geyser bubbled up from the tile. A pool was spreading across Minnie's familiar bathroom floor, so dark red that it was nearly black. She would later tell an AP reporter, I didn't get scared because I didn't know where it was coming from. Now, listeners, you may be wondering, but no, it didn't occur to her that it might be blood. Why would it? True crime podcasts wouldn't exist for another 30 years. At this point, different news outlets offer alternative versions of what Minnie decided to do about this bizarre turn of events. Some sources say she called for Will, and then that he got out of bed and hurried down the hall to see what was wrong. Others say that Minnie left the bathroom to wake him, and we think that's more likely, based on her later comments. But when she turned down that hall, she was met with another surprise. Reporter Ken Sugar wrote that five of the home's rooms had been splattered in the red liquid 
concentrated apparently near the air and heating vents. It was splashed across walls, spattered on their belongings like drops of paint. Some spots would be found later, behind furniture or in corners. Most were the size of dimes, others were as big as silver dollars. Many woke Will, who certainly didn't have any answers. Perhaps someone could have snuck in and splashed paint or something like it through their house, but Will had indeed set the security alarm that night. He always did, and it hadn't been tripped. And those spots were such a particular color. Per the AP, the Winstons called emergency services, who responded with a fire truck. The firemen took one look around, saw the red splashed walls, and called for the Atlanta Police Department. The AP also reported that the responding officers saw no signs of a break-in and no evidence of a crime. The Winstons themselves were uninjured, but the walls were dripping red. And though no one had confirmation, these were emergency professionals. They were used to seeing blood, and it certainly appeared that they had a house full of the stuff on their hands. And blood has to come from somewhere, or rather, someone. Per the AP, samples were taken by responding EMS workers and sent to Grady Memorial Hospital for testing. It would be fairly simple to determine if the substance was blood and then to see if it was human. Blood typing, though, if it turned out to be needed, that would take longer. Meanwhile, an investigation was conducted. Atlanta homicide detective Steve Cartwright was in charge that night. He would go on to write a book about his experience on the force, and that included what would come to be known as the Atlanta Bleeding House. According to Cartwright's book, he remembered asking Minnie about that geyser of blood in the bathroom. Had she imagined it? And that she told him calmly, I know what I saw. Not that it was blood necessarily, but she knew it had come up from her floor. The Winstons weren't hysterical. They were too reasonable, tired people with a house full of strangers and, apparently, a lot of blood, and they were waiting for answers. Detective Cartwright conducted his own search of the house, looking for weapons or other evidence. In the process, he checked the washing machine. Now, in his book, he describes washers and dryers as common hiding places for weapons. Maybe someone had run through the house and stashed them, or the source of the blood. But he only found Minnie's pink slippers covered in red stains. During the search, he found one other item of note, a straw broom leaning against the wall outside the house. There were specks of red along its bottom edge. Minnie's explanations were simple. First, she'd gotten her slippers wet on her way to check on Will. As for the broom, she'd wanted to clean up her house, but the firemen had warned her to wait for police. Perhaps officials were suspicious of the Winstons. But based on archived interviews, the couple seemed as confused as everyone else. As Will himself told an AP reporter, I don't know what the stuff is. My wife is upset because she doesn't know where it's come from. Me, I'm not bothered by it because I'm in bad enough shape as it is. According to Ken Sugar, the police would soon verify that it was indeed human blood not a prop, and not an animal. And like that pool across the bathroom floor, the story was spreading. First in Atlanta and then beyond. Newspapers as far as the Pacific Northwest picked up the story of the quiet elderly couple whose house had become a nightmare. Would it happen again? The Winstons insisted that there was no recurrence. But if a house could erupt in blood once, well, it might do it again and that possibility sold papers. When people read the stories, they wondered about the Winstons. Was it all a stunt? They'd waited a while to call for help. Why? Maybe embarrassment, maybe fear. At least one newspaper reported that one of their adult children was a police officer. If that was accurate information, could it have affected their decision to call? Perhaps they didn't want to make a fuss but as the days passed, none of the evidence pointed towards the Winstons. Per the AP, the blood test came back one by one. 
First, typing the blood at the house. It was O. Some had suspected the Winstons of using Will's dialysis machine to spray the blood, but no, he was type A. So was Minnie. It wasn't their blood. According to the Atlanta Constitution, a paranormal investigator from South Georgia managed to get a tour of the home. We don't have any reports of his findings, but we like to imagine that it went something like a cable television ghost hunting program. Lots of asking, what was that? While stumbling around in the darkness. That's just an educated guess. Detective Cartwright, he assured the news outlets that there was no supernatural cause. He wasn't saying, though, what he thought might have happened. The police remained circumspect. According to Cartwright's book, back at APD, his lieutenant was less than thrilled with the media attention. Unsolved Mysteries was calling, along with every network. He wanted the case resolved. But where could he even start? How do you solve the impossible. Those same reporters and shows endlessly harassed the Winstons. At first, the Winstons were willing to do walkthroughs and interviews, but soon they were fed up. The couple hung up their phone. They wouldn't answer the door. They yelled out of windows that they weren't bleeding, that there was no blood, and that everyone should just move along. It was around this time that Ken Sugar wrote that the Winstons suggested that die from a rug had been to blame, and later that they developed their own theory, that steam from the pipes had mixed with rust and traveled through the house, suddenly staining everything bright red. They didn't care what the hospital tests had proved. As far as they were concerned, reporters could stop calling. Sugar quoted Will Winston as saying, it was a lie that there was ever blood in this house. Another AP article captured Minnie's exhaustion with the entire process. I still don't know where the blood came from, and I'm tired of all these people asking me all these questions. If anybody comes here today, I'm not going to open the door. The phone rang all night, people asking me questions. I'm fed up with all of this. Finally, an officer was posted outside the Winston's door, and then the Atlanta Police Department closed the case, citing the Winston's privacy and the lack of any discernible crime. Atlanta was left without answers. What did people think at the time? We're not sure, but over the past few decades, internet sleuths have had time to come up with a few different theories. Here's what we've seen. First, the Winstons had used blood from their own bodies or from the dialysis treatments that Will needed every day. But as we told you, the final test proved that the blood was type O and the Winstons type A. And why would they do it? They didn't sell their story. They didn't want to move. And as far as we've been able to find, they didn't want anything from the city. Here's another theory that perhaps their landlord wanted to scare them out of the home. But again, why? There were no reported problems. It would stand to reason that having good long-term renters would beat an empty house. Here's another take on the inside job scenario. Some bloggers and Reddit posters have suggested that the Winstons somehow acquired the blood and then created the mess themselves. And here's their reasoning behind that. They think the couple wanted to attract the attention and therefore the sympathy of their adult children. But that seems both extreme and excessively complicated. And it doesn't answer the biggest question. Where would they have gotten the blood? The same goes for the Winston's children, who have also been posed as possibilities by these same internet sleuths. Besides an absolute lack of clear motive, we're back to the original problem, procurement. After all, Detective Steve Cartwright later wrote that his lieutenant had called all over town. None of the blood banks were missing bags. And this was during the AIDS epidemic, when blood was scarce and held under high security. Now, a prank was possible. 
some stranger or enemy sneaking in. But Will said that he'd set the house alarm and neither spouse saw anyone. Plus, many saw that first puddle in the bathroom where she'd been alone for some time. Someone might have been in the basement, might have managed to get it up through the floorboards and tile, but what about the walls on the main story? Could they have done all of that using only the HVAC vents? Now, of course, there is one last theory. Perhaps the mystery is truly supernatural. According to the Winstons, they've never experienced anything like it before, and no one has offered up any proof of prior activity. Not a single handy ghost has popped up to offer an explanation. No urban legends have slid into place, willing to fill the void. Perhaps, as one neighbor mysteriously told Atlanta Constitution reporter Walter Miller, quote, it was a scientific matter. Miller asked the neighbor to elaborate further, but she refused. At the time, she was watching the house from a safe distance on the sidewalk. Detective Steve Cartwright told the Associated Press at the time, quote, there must be some explanation for it but the Atlanta Police Department didn't pursue that explanation any further. A sergeant told reporter Ken Sugar, quote, we've done a thorough investigation. Until such time we've determined a crime was committed, it doesn't merit a whole group of investigators working on it when there are homicides to be solved. And that was that, as far as the Bleeding House was concerned. It never offered a second performance, at least not as far as anyone knows. If it had, would the Winstons have told anyone? Maybe not. After all, when news got out, it had brought them nothing but trouble. Maybe a bleeding house would have been easier to deal with than a yard full of news reporters and hungry spectators. Either way, the Winstons kept quiet, and the story faded away slowly, like bloodstains on a tiled bathroom floor. If the house on Fountain Drive has misbehaved again in later decades, well, no one has been willing to admit it. We hope you'll join us next time for another real life story from the fine print of America's local papers, from the lives of regular people, just like you and me except for one strange thing. Oh, and strangers. One Strange Thing is an entirely independent production. To support the show and to hear more of the entirely true and enticingly peculiar, join us over on Patreon. There you'll get ad-free early releases of our regular episodes, a full-length bonus episode every month, and plenty of other fun content. We hope you'll check it out. Please stay tuned for a moment to hear a promo from one of our favorite shows. We hope you'll give them a listen. Pause the podcast you're listening to right now and subscribe to Ghost Town. Ghost Town is me, Rebecca Lieb. And me, Jason Horton. And we explore all kinds of weird history, true crime, hauntings, paranormal events, and more. We cover the Slenderman stabbing, Tesla's death ray, the D.B. Cooper copycat, the cheerleader murder plot, Heaven's Gate, the Lars Midtank mystery, and Tuesday's Child, Ellie's first satanic magazine, just to name a few. You can find Ghost Town on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, Stitcher, or wherever you listen to podcasts.